Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. The podcast where our philosophy is in in for a penny, in for a pound. <clears throat> well, we're probably going to do one of these this week because um, of time constraints and everything. And, and, and I am I am coming off of this illness where um, I didn't have a voice for several days. And, and uh, so we're only going to do one of these. You may tell my voice it's still not 100% there. I don't have a high range in my voice right now for some reason. Um, I tell you, man, uh, living where we live, but if it's not the pollen, if it's not the whatever, there's always something going on that is uh, making everybody all clogged up and all congested. And so, one of the, any of us are ever able to speak at all. Um, so, all four of you that listen to this, I, I um, hope you won't be too disappointed. We're gonna we're gonna do this this way. So, but I want to start off before we're we're gonna get into. Uh, uh, the 11th lesson of Mark. Before then, I want to read you a little uh, essay, or whatever you want to call it, by Oswald Smith. Now, if you don't know who Oswald Smith is, excuse me, I have a little bio of him. I can I can run past you uh, if I can find it. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, so you can hear all that going on with me. Okay, forget the bow. Here we are. The title of this little uh, write-up is called The Whole Estate by Oswald Smith. <clears throat> the master of an estate tells his servants that he is leaving, but that he will be returning. While he has gone there to bring the entire estate under cultivation. <clears throat> they begin work around the house to beautify the gardens and the flower beds. Next year, the weeds grow, and again, they go to work, keeping the lawns in perfect condition. Presently, one of them remembers one of his master's orders. I must go, he exclaims. Our master told us to bring the entire estate under cultivation. And he prepares to leave. But, they cry, we cannot spare you. See how fast the weeds grow. We need you here. In spite of their protests, however, he leaves and begins working in a far corner of the estate. Later on, two others remember their lord's orders. And in spite of objections, they too go and cultivate another part of the estate. At last, their master returns. He is pleased as he looks at the flower beds and gardens and the lawns around his house. But before rewarding his servants, he decides to explore the rest of his estate. And as he does so, his heart sinks, for he sees nothing but wilderness and marsh. And he realizes that there has not even been an attempt made to cultivate it. Finally comes the one man working all by himself in a distant part of the estate. He rewards him richly. He discovers the two and still another part and likewise rewards them. Then he returns to headquarters where his servants are waiting and expecting a reward, but his face indicates displeasure. Have we not been faithful, they exclaim. Look at these flower beds and gardens. Look at these lawns. Are they not beautiful? And have we not worked hard? Yes, he replies. You have done your best. You have been faithful. You have labored diligently. Well, then, they cry. Why are you disappointed? Are we not entitled to a reward? There's one thing you've forgotten, he replies. You've forgotten my orders. I did not tell you to work the same gardens and lawns again and again, year after year. I told you to bring the entire estate under cultivation to cultivate it at least once. That you did not do. In fact, you did not even attempt to cultivate it. When your companions insist upon going and doing their part, you objected. No, there is no reward for you. Many a one, I'm afraid, is going to be disappointed. You may be that one. You may have won many souls in your town. You may have been the most faithful to your church. But what have you done for those in heathen darkness? Did you ever think of going yourself? Have you ever given your money that someone else might go? Have you prayed? What part have you had in the evangelization of the world? Have you obeyed orders? Have you done what you could do to bring the entire estate under cultivation? Or have you been satisfied to work in your own community and let the rest of the world perish? Well, I'll tell you, um, that's something to think about. And obviously, Oswald Smith, his his mindset was missions. His mindset was going to the farthest reaches of the earth um, and, and taking the gospel to people who have never heard it. It is interesting how we all have our little thing to do, and we all think that our thing is the only thing. And we all think that our thing is the only thing that's worth doing, and our thing is the only thing that's going on. And I really, I really thought about this a lot because um, 
I labor in an area of the country, an area of the world where I, there's not a whole lot of quote unquote fruit, not a whole lot of quote unquote success. And uh, you get to passages in the New Testament where Jesus tells the disciples to go into a town and if that town doesn't receive them, then they dust off their feet and move on to the next town. And so there are some of these festivals that we work at, some of these events we go to. We have been going there 10, 15, 17, 18, 20, 22 years. And we've seen one or two people get saved. We've given out thousands of tracts. We've talked to, you know, a couple hundred people or whatever. And what we're seeing is a lot of apathy. And it has been suggested to me by well-meaning people that once you reach a point in which most of your efforts are met with apathy, then you are obligated to go move on to another area. And that sounds great, and that sounds very uh, spiritual. But the fact is, look, in a community, you will have a body of believers. And those body of believers, they have houses, they have families, they have businesses, they have roots in that community. And they are not, it is not practical to expect, let's say, you know, the First Baptist Church of, of Umpty Squat, Georgia, to evangelize for several years. And then once the crowd dies down, and once they're no longer received, and once they've knocked on every door in their community, to just pick up roots in the entire church, move to some area where there's not a church, and start over. There is a calling, there is a ministry for people to remain in place in a community. And I'm not saying this, I'm not saying Oswald Smith is 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 downgrading that. I'm saying that he is in that essay, he is so focused on missions and cultivating the far end of the estate that somebody has to stay at the house and, and weed the garden. Um we all have different parts to play. <clears throat> I would love to be in the Philippines right now teaching the Bible. God has not seen fit for that to work out for a variety of reasons. And one of the hardest things of my life has is, and I'm still struggling with this, is learning to be content preaching in the same little town in the Bible Belt where nobody cares. It's rough. Um, so, so what I'm saying is, is, is that Yes, the church should always be expanding outward, but then there is a part of the church that is that is that is to occupy the, an area that has been expanded into. The place I'm sitting right now, uh, this part of the country, you know, 200 years ago, 250 years ago, had no gospel witness. People came, they brought the gospel, they won people to the Lord, they established churches, and the gospel and churches pretend uh, continued to be a presence in this community. Because somebody stuck around. They didn't go, okay, people here are saved, let's move on. You have an obligation to the people that you lead to the Lord to disciple them, to teach them the Bible, and 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 to provide the structure by which these baby Christians need to grow. So you can't have the entire church be a missionary, is what I'm saying. Somebody has to stay in, you know, and, and weed the garden. <clears throat> Those people that stay in with their garden are not secondary citizens. They're not second class citizens. The guys that put money in the plate to keep the lights on so that the, so that the, the local assembly has a place to meet that where the roof isn't falling in, those guys are as important as the guy going to the mission field. And I'm not saying Oswald Smith said he wasn't as important. But the time that he was coming on the scene, Oswald Smith, the churches were established and they were and there was there was very little mission work going on he's part of that great movement coming out of north america to the rest of the world and so i mean honestly you need never start another church in south georgia ever again um you need never start another church in alabama ever again you never start another church in north carolina ever again so if you're given the option between starting a you know the 34th baptist church in a town of three thousand people or going to India, I'd say go to India. Uh, but if your spot in the body is to maintain a presence in a community, and you, you, you know, we, we preach to the same people over and over and over again. And some of those people that we preach to, we've been preaching to for 20 years. But those people have kids. And those people have relatives, and those people have people that didn't haven't seen us on that same corner for twenty years, and they're seeing us for the first time. So, so a population is not static. 
and uh, it's not always, I mean, it's a lot of the same people, but it's not always the same people. And long term, you're going to continue to evangelize in an area that has always been, has already been evangelized because there's new people coming to the area, either by birth or by migration. All this is part of the work of the gospel. All this is part of the work of the ministry. The part where you lead people, Lord, is part of the work of the ministry. The part where you train people up is part of the ministry. The part where some of those people leave where you train them at and go someplace else to replicate that work in another place, that is all part of the ministry. And sometimes when you get guys like like my, my friend Oswald here, they, uh, they miss the forest for the trees. Mark. Lesson 11, which takes us to Mark chapter 1. I, you know, I think about things. I think about how uh, I've had people tell me a couple of different things. They told me that, uh, first of all, I shouldn't go preach in a place where another church already has a ministry. Because I'm, I'm interfering with the authority of that church to preach in that area. I, I don't know what people say things. And they'd like, do you, do you even think about what you're saying? First of all, if I had a ministry in an area, and I do, and somebody else wanted to come along and do a very similar thing, I would say, hey, man, more the merrier. If every Christian would speak, then every every man would hear. we got a guy in our community uh, that preaches outside every once in a while, and he has a big elaborate setup, much more elaborate and much more uh, dependent upon technology than what we do. He has loudspeakers and he has a you know streaming thing and he's got cameras and he's got all this stuff set up he uses a generator to power all this and it's 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 very involved um we've decided not to be that way we decided to be light and mobile and do it old school but i'm not mad at this guy he is not competition for me i welcome the fellowship i welcome the fact that i can't be everywhere and so somebody else should be somewhere I know I'm getting off topic. This is going to turn into the whole thing, right? We should probably stop. But just, I, I thought about it. I thought about how, how you know, uh, 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 you come into an area and you're evangelizing an area where there are already established churches. We've seen where churches see us as a threat to to uh, whatever. I don't know. I don't know what it is, what it is we're doing to them, but, but we have seen it. <clears throat> so there's, no, there's nothing wrong with evangelizing an area that's already been evangelized. There's no, there's no, there's no, uh, there's nothing wrong with making sure at every opportunity uh, that that everyone in your community is confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's also nothing wrong with getting on a boat and going to India, and laboring there alone for all of your life. So, we all got different different uh, notes to play. But people have told me that I need to stop going to this, and stop going to that because no one's getting saved. Uh, I don't know what the criteria would be for you to abandon a work to abandon a ministry. You know, how many people, let's say, let's say 20 people a year get saved or whatever. And then after a few years, 15 people a year are getting saved. And then 10 people a year are getting saved. Then five people you're getting saved. Okay, fine. Where's the cutoff? At what point scripturally do you say, okay, we're done with this because we're not getting the results that we think we should be getting. There's no scriptural line. There's no, there's no scriptural basis for abandoning work just because you don't perceive it or other people don't perceive it as being successful. And I said a lot to sell that. I need to get off this hobby horse because uh, my voice is quickly fading. And we've got important things to talk about, like what the Bible actually says, instead of Michael's goofball theories. All right, Mark chapter 1, I said, verse uh, 19. <clears throat> when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and left, they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. Now we know from Luke 5 that James and John were business partners with Simon Peter, and that Peter uh, owned the ship that they were on. And here we see Zebedee. I looked at, I ran, I ran all the references of Zebedee's, because I was like, what, who is Zebedee? Who is this guy? Well, every time Zebedee's mentioned, he's mentioned as being somebody's dad. You don't know a whole lot about him. Um, and I'd said before that, you know, that, uh, you would assume that Peter is a successful fisherman, but every time you see him actually fishing, he's getting skunk. So anyway, so Andrew had met Jesus before and Peter met Jesus before and James and John are there for the overhaul of the fish, which explains why in verse 19, they're mending their nets. As I mentioned before, uh, 
and it's important to understand that, that when he says, uh, you know, uh, in verse 17, come unto me after me, and I'll make you fishers of men. It, it is important to understand uh, that none of this happened out of the blue. And you might you might get that impression if all you had was one gospel, but you don't. Look at verse 21. And they went to Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered in the synagogue and taught. Now, Capernaum is a fishing village. On, it's sort of on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, as I've said before. Honestly, I don't know a whole lot about how synagogues work. Um, the word only shows up in the New Testament. So it's one of those things that it's like uh, you have the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and New Testament where you don't have Pharisees and Sadducees in the Old Testament, but you do you do have them in the Gospels. And you don't have synagogues in the Old Testament, but you do have them in the Gospel. But if you look at Luke 4, which we've covered before a little bit, we can learn a little bit about just, just the bare bones of how a synagogue works by looking at Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, let's see here. And when you come to Nazareth, verse 16, uh, where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for the read. And was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. So we know that the synagogue, however the structure, we know that you have a person there whose job is a minister. And we know that looks like somebody... I don't know how they pick them. It doesn't say. It looks like somebody reads scripture out loud. And it's always interesting that twice in Luke 4, it's called a book. It's not called a scroll. It says he closed the book. You don't close a scroll. You roll up a scroll. I think that's interesting. I think I think uh, we assume a lot. We, 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 we have pictures in our head from movies or from whatever, and those pictures may not be accurate. I said before how yeah, this picture in your head of Jesus walking around in a white robe with a purple sash on like he just won the Miss America contest. There's nothing to indicate that. Where would even buy clothes? Where do you even get clothes like that? Yes, I'd like, you know, six white robes with purple sashes, please. Yeah, get the money from Judas. He's got the bag. So Jesus obviously wore the same clothes everybody else wore, and I, I really believe you couldn't pick the guy out of a crowd. We have that mental picture. So we have this mental picture from people in the Old Testament or in the Bible days go to read something. They have this big scroll they enroll. And so, you know, you got a guy that's carrying around 39 scrolls of the Old Testament. But according to Isaiah, or I'm sorry, according to uh, Luke, they were in a book form. So they were compiled. They brought him the book of Isaiah. So he had at least Isaiah bound in some sort of book. I don't know why that's important, but it seems like it's important. And I don't know. So, so back to back to Mark 1. And they went to Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath, they entered in the synagogue and taught. Now, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure why Jesus, who was a stranger, more or less, passing through, although some people knew who he was. Simon knew who he was. Andrew knew who he was. James John knew who he was. <coughs> you know, um, I don't know why he's allowed to speak. I don't, there's a lot about this, the inner workings of the, the I don't want to say the politics of it, but the inner workings of synagogue life that I don't understand. It doesn't look like he did. It doesn't look like he spoke every time he went to a synagogue. But every time he did speak, he upset the apple cart. He 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 challenged uh, what people thought of verse man. He challenged what people how people were living. Now think about this though. The Bible says it was his custom to attend synagogue. So there are lots of services, and I'm going to make some parallels here between here and a church service. Although they're they're not the quite the, the same thing. There are obviously some elements in common. <clears throat> But um, so there's lots of services with Jesus in the congregation. I mean, every Sabbath day, that was his custom, right? So, so he's 30 years old. Let's say he starts going to, you know, Sabbath, starts going to synagogue from the time he can walk. That's 52 Sabbaths a year, 30 years, you know, a hundred something days, a hundred something times this guy's in a synagogue somewhere. And I've thought about this before. Um, like I said, there's nothing, nothing about him that we should, uh, desire him. He looked like a common, ordinary garden variety Jewish fellow from back then. 
and he's attending these church, these, these synagogue services. I mean, just think about it. You're sitting there in a building with other people who have gathered for, on the Sabbath for the synagogue, for the reading of the scripture, whatever, whatever. And Jesus Christ is sitting in the pew behind you. Would that be a little weird? Would that be a little, if you understood who was with you? He told the woman of the well, said, if you understood who was talking to you, you'd ask me to give you living water, right? So the people that didn't, that around it didn't always understand who they were talking to. Jesus had friends. Jesus had neighbors. Jesus had kids that grew up down the street from him. He lived as a man. And that includes having people that just know you casually. Or people that know your mom or people that know your brother and recognize you, oh, you're James's brother. All that, all the interactions of human beings that we normally, we tend to think of Jesus as being this isolated thing, but he's the man Christ Jesus. So as the man Christ Jesus, he attended synagogue. So you're sitting there in your pew with all your heartaches and all your problems and all your whatever and all your shortcomings and sitting directly behind you is the son of God. And he's listening to the same preaching that you're listening to. Think about this. You get up to preach. And you look out in the congregation and Jesus is sitting there. Listening. Waiting. Hoping that you'll finish up soon. I mean, imagine you're at the Sabbath potluck or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. what I'm assuming <coughs> there's a lot of meals tied to early worship in the Bible, which is something we should probably get back to. Another sermon for another time. But let's say you're at the Sabbath potluck or whatever, and you're sitting at the little picnic table. Look, I, this is all I can relate it to. I, I'm an American. I, and so you ask Jesus to pass you the salt. I mean, you know how, 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 how surreal that would be. I mean, the incarnation is, 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 is the wildest thing ever. There's lots of elements about it that we don't think about because we're looking at the high points of, that are covered in, in the Gospels, and uh, we don't think about all the stuff that happened in between. I mean, you could make the case very easily based on his behavior that Jesus Christ, the Alpha, the Omega, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who hung the sun, hung the moon, hung the stars, the one uh, <clears throat> the worlds were framed by his word, uh, the one who upholds all things by his power, that guy preferred the company of just average common people. He was all those things, but at the same time, Jesus Christ was a small town kid from a little town in the middle of nowhere. And he did not uh, make his way to the palace to hang out with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the big shots. He didn't make his way to the financial district to hang out with the, the hoity torties. He preferred the company of common, average, everyday people. That's the people he chose to be around. People with problems and heartaches and bills. People with disappointments and people who are a disappointment. I mean, Colossians 2 says, In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And I have tried for years to wrap my brain around that. That that, that all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that God... The Bible says the heaven of heavens cannot contain the Lord, right? But yet, the, the body of this carpenter... In Palestine, can hold him. How do you take all that God is, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and how do you pack that into a human body without it, you know, burning up or glowing in the dark or something? It's just wild stuff. <coughs> and a lot more can be said about that. Verse 22. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. So this tells us a couple of things. The scribes didn't teach us that they had any authority. Right? When the scribes got up and taught, and when Jesus got up and taught, it sounded like this guy, Jesus, knows what he's talking about, and the other guys don't. Look at Matthew 5. So we get some idea of what this sounds like or what this looks like to teach with no authority versus teaching with authority. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, verse 31. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving the cause of fornic fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. 
Again, you've heard them, it's been said of them old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Uh, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. He goes on, goes on, goes on. So Jesus says over and over again, he says, uh, so and so says this, and I say that. So he, you and I do not have, let me make sure I can say this right. So when Jesus Christ gets up to expound upon a, a portion of scripture or a, a rule or a, or a custom or whatever, he is able to tell you both the letter of the law and the, and, and the intent of the scripture. Um, that's something you and I are not, not always great at. I mean, I can piece together things, and I try to. And I try to use other verses to define the words or provide a context. But Jesus Christ regularly uh, clarified a standalone statement with another standalone statement. Christ would regularly quote a verse without mentioning the context, and then he would provide his own context. Right? And when people heard that, they recognized it as authority. Here's a man who knows what he's talking about. He's not just reciting what Moses said. He's explained to you why Moses said that and why it's important. And here are the implications of it. And here's the application of it. And he's, and, and that the, the, you know, it's almost like uh, it could be. So you have, you have the intertestamental period between the end of Malachi and the, in the ministry of John the Baptist. You have 400 and whatever years, 400 and change years of where God said nothing to anybody as far as written revelation, as far as open revelation. You see, he spoke to Simon. You see, he spoke to some other people. But as far as the, 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 the part of the Bible where God goes radio silence for a while, 400 years of that. There are some people that might just have been, when Jesus showed up, they really might have been just ready for somebody to take a Bible and explain to them what this meant. Because all they had had for 400 years was people repeating things that they had learned, that they had learned, they had learned. There's a, there's a spot for that. And there's a place for that. And we have an advantage in the New Testament that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit that can give insight into the scriptures that you would not have without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He'll explain the verses to you. He'll explain the passages to you. He'll give you the context to give you the application. And then you have a responsibility to go and pass that information to other people. Um, um, and so, so what these people wanted, I think, one of the reasons Jesus was received so gladly is he could give them the explanation they had been waiting generations for. They had been waiting longer than my country has been around. For somebody to come along and explain to them, well, what did Moses mean when he wrote it to build a war? What did Moses mean when he said, can't put your wife away for the, any cause? What did Moses mean? All this stuff that no one was explaining to them, Jesus comes along and explains to them. And they took that as, this guy knows what he's talking about. Now, take a quick look at 1 Timothy 2. This doesn't have a ton to do with anything, but I, I, I just want to talk about it for a minute. And we'll see... Uh, We'll see how much gas this old man's got in a tank. <clears throat> I'm really <coughs> I'm pushing my voice out here, and uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, 1 Timothy 2. 1 12. I suffer, but I suffer a woman not to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but be in silence. So that implies that somebody can teach. The woman can't teach, and the woman can't uh, usurp authority over a man. But it implies, the fact that verse is there implies that somebody else can, that somebody is qualified to teach, and some people are qualified to exercise authority over other men in regards to the church. So, look at 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. That's 1 Corinthians. I don't want to do any good. 2 Corinthians 10. The Bible do say in verse 8, uh, for though I should boast somewhat of our more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as it would, I would terrify you by letters. So a man exercising the authority that God gives him in regards to church life, in regards to a teaching uh, sort of situation, a man does that not to build a crowd or to line his pockets or to have one more subscriber to his podcast. He does it to edify and he does it to not destroy. 
and a man who has the ability to teach the Bible and the ability that ability manifest look 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 at Second Timothy two. You know the things that, that people consider important and things that God considers important are vastly different. My ways not your ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And all that kind of stuff, right? So we'll look at a guy who's a great speaker. We'll look at Stephen Furtick. Stephen Furtick is a very engaging, uh, charismatic sort of fella. I think doctrinally he's a mess. I think uh, 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 he always takes the verse and he applies it to himself. It's just it's kind of weird how he does that. Uh, but if that man could take he could talk about anything and people would find it engaging. He has a very engaging personality. And so people say, well, that there right there is a sign that God has gifted him to be able to teach the Bible. But I don't see it that way. Um, look at Second Timothy, uh, what did I say? Second Timothy 2. Start in verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the graces in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard of me among and many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So the qualification... <laughs> the qualification for you to be able to teach the Bible is not necessarily that you're talented at it, not necessarily that you're good at it. The The qualification to teach the Bible, according to 2 Timothy 2, is that you be faithful to do so. You kind of a faithful guy who is dull as toast, and he is better qualified to teach the Bible than a super whiz-bang, look at me, I'm so cool guy, that doesn't that, that can't be faithful to the things God's given him. So my point in that is, if you're as dull as toast, I mean, you should work on that. But just being dull as toast by itself does not disqualify you. Being unfaithful does disqualify you. But the good news is, you can decide to be faithful, and you can fix that. Uh. I mean, Paul, the Apostle Paul, you know, oh, Paul, oh, Paul is a good guy. Yeah, Paul's a great guy. Great. Paul literally bored a guy to death with his preaching. So, so it'll be okay. So a man who has, who has, a, who is faithful uh, to teach the Bible, he, 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 technically, I think he has an obligation to do so. Now, most of that has nothing to do with. Uh, with Mark one, but I, I knew that when I went down that road. Now look at look so, but but look, look at Mark's look at uh, Matthew seven. We're talking about the authority Jesus had in the things he said, and that authority people saw it and they understood. This is a guy who's not just one more Johnny Come Lately, just one more Levi, just one more whatever who's up here repeating what we said a hundred times. There is a New Testament ministry of te- of telling people things they already know. And reminding people, one of the things about preaching is um, you will you will you will repeat yourself a lot. And if you're preaching to people who've been in church for a million years, then you're not you're probably not going to say anything that they haven't already heard. But here, the fact is that you have been looking at this and you've been studying this and you've been thinking about this, and they haven't. So you put in the work of looking at it and studying it and thinking about it and praying about it, and they get the benefit of getting a concise explanation or a concise, succinct reminder of what God said and what God thinks about a topic. It's quite the labor-saving device. Um, what did I say? Matthew 7. So Matthew 7 is a long dissertation that starts, uh, let's see, I got all these red-letter Bibles, so I, I'd say it's a solid wall of red text from Matthew 5, Matthew, all of Matthew 6, it, Matt, most of Matthew 7. <laughs> so it's this one long dissertation that Jesus gives apparently at one at one sitting and um it it covers a wide variety of topics uh, including everybody's favorite out of context verse uh Matthew 7 to 1 if i had a nickel for everybody on the street corner that ever told it, told us you can't be judging me the bible says you're not supposed to judge people why are you judging me and they can't show you where this verse is and they certainly can't give you the context of Matthew seven one. If I had a nickel for every every time uh, that it happened, I would have uh, I'd have a lot of nickels. My dad used to say, "If I had a nickel for every time a woman did me wrong, I'd have thirty seven cents." 
don't know if that shows that my dad's a smart aleck or if he's bad at math. I don't know. But anyway, if I had a nickel for every time someone used that verse, Matthew 7, 1, without knowing where it is and not and without considering Matthew 7, 2 um, and following, that's then I'd, I'd have a lot of nickels. Um, but anyway, the, the point is, so all the stuff that happens in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, when it gets to the end of Matthew 7, verse 28, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his doctrine. So, so all the teaching, uh, all the parables, all the metaphors, all those explanations he gives, collectively, those are considered doctrine. And verse 28, once again, Jesus spoke with authority when he gave those things. He said, of course he spoke with authority. Well, people recognize it as such. Doesn't mean they necessarily did anything about it. I mean, I recognize the the speed limit exists. I just don't have much regard for it. Verse 23. Back, back to Mark 1, verse 23. <laughs> and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, he cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. But they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For what, with what authority, sorry, for with authority commanded he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Uh, it is interesting the prevalence of devil possession in the Gospels. You go back into your Old Testament, and I can really only think of one example of it in the Old Testament. That's Saul, where it says an evil spirit came and, and you know made him throw javelins at people and all kind of bizarre behavior. Um, you don't see a whole, you just don't see it. I mean, if you've got any other examples, please let me know. It's the only thing I can ever think of. But you get here in the New Testament, you get here in, in, in the Gospels, and, and it is everywhere. Devils, devils, unclean spirits, foul spirits, devils, devils, everywhere you go. And it's, it's really, I have a, so, okay, so you have it a bunch here during the ministry of Jesus Christ. You have it a bunch at the beginning of the book of Acts. And then about Acts 8 or so, 8, 9, somewhere up in there, um, it kind of drops off. And it's not mentioned at all in the church epistles about how to deal with it. It's not mentioned at all how to commit uh uh, exorcisms in the, in, in, in the church epistles. There's, no, there's nothing, there's no advice given to you there about how to, how to deal with things. <clears throat> we, uh, we had a guy come to church. We were going to church up in Brunswick and uh, the guy shows up and he's, he wanted uh, our pastor to go in there and do a uh, exorcism on his house. He said his house was haunted and he wanted uh, Kenny to go down there and do an exorcism. And uh, Kenny's like, well, that's not a New Testament thing to do. It's not a church thing to do. I'm not a Catholic priest. And he says, what makes you think your house is haunted? He goes, well, sometimes things aren't where I left them. And Kenny's like, Can't you, couldn't you just been forgetful? Well, sometimes doors are closed. And, you know, because that blows your house level. If your house is off a level a little bit, you know, the wind and air pressure, doors are closed, things will happen. And he goes, look, I think what's happening is your house is haunted. It's haunted by you. He says, look, the church, church has got no, uh, no business and all that. Um, but anyway, so, so you got that stuff all in the, in the gospels, <coughs> you have it some in the, in the book of Acts, but for seven or eight chapters and then, and then it drops off to nothing. I know if you look around, you can see, you know, whatever. And then in Revelation 16, bam, that stuff shows back up. Now I can speculate about why that is, but all that would be, would be speculation. Um, I've watched some of these videos of these people that the Catholic priest is in there. I've got a book in the house. Um, I was trying to find it the other day. I can't find it, but I know I, don't, I know I have it, and I know I did not get rid of it. So it's somewhere in all my my cornucopia of books. But uh, this book is uh, about how to get rid of evil spirits, and uh, it is all a bunch of Catholic mumbo jumbo, a bunch of Hollywood tripe, right? So you see in the movies that the priest goes in, he's got the little robe on, he's got the you know the the, the little sash on, and he's got the got the holy water which there's no such thing in the bible and he's got the crucifix which is you know a dumb thing idol idolatrous thing that people come out with 
and you got these people that are just playing some of the legitimate um, trappings of, 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 of devil possession that you see in Mark 5 and you see here in Mark 1. And these things are snarling. And, and, and I mean, I'm looking, I'm watching these videos and, and these people are speaking and they don't have like normal human voices. And some of these videos are from back in the 90s before it was easy to augment that stuff, you know, on, on, on the video side. These are all analog VHS tapes and stuff. It seems that these people are snarling and they're, they're, you know, six or seven people are trying to hold them down. And so, so there's something going on there. I'm not going to say there's nothing going on there. Uh, but I will say that <laughs> there's no, there's no instruction in the New Testament about how to, how to do that. And so this book I've got at the house, it's called, like I said, Casting Out Evil Spirits or Deliverance from Evil Spirits. It's got all these mumbo jumbo, you know, Catholic dogma nonsense that you do. You come in there and you swing rosaries around, you throw water on people and you chant, you know, fee fi fo fum and all that stuff. And it's just a bunch of it's it's just a it's it's just a bunch of bunkum, man. Pure bunkum with with no with no scriptural backing. But back to our fella here in Mark One for our chase another rabbit. Um so so this guy here is at the synagogue. Right? He's not he's not He's not like the guy in Mark 5 when he's hanging out the tombs. This guy is at the synagogue. Now, I submit to you that the reason this guy is at church, for you know, lack of a better word, uh, and specifically he's at the service where Jesus Christ is attending. You know, it's funny. When this guy gets cast out, when he gets the devils cast out of him, everybody understands what just happened. Everybody understands this guy had devils. Apparently, everybody knew it and could not do anything about it. Uh, and they understood that Jesus had been the one to cast him out of devils. In fact, that sets up the whole stage for a bunch of stuff that happens later. But the reason this guy is at, at church, church, and specifically the, the, the service that Jesus Christ is at, is because in Isaiah 14, 14, we know that the devil's desire is to be like the Most High. And so because he's, desi- he's, he's, he's very interested uh, in the realm of worship, it's funny how people think that the devil's at the pool hall or is at the dance hall. No, he's at the house of worship. <clears throat> the devil is way more interested in what's going on at the church house than what's going on in the strip joint. That's just that's just how it is. So next time you're in church, you know, look around. <clears throat> There's no telling who's hanging out. We were at a church uh, in a small town in Georgia, and uh, which describes a good chunk of my life, I guess. And this church had an ongoing problem with weird uh, paranormal stuff happening at the church house. Like in the building, and uh, it was it was just it was just on like you would be in that building by yourself, and you would hear voices, and you would hear doors open and close, and you would hear you know whatever. And uh, I had gone back, so we'd left church, and I had forgot my accordion was there. So we'd go back to the church house, and I and I go back inside, <clears throat> and all I've got to do is walk. All right, two stories, this one and then another one. All I've got to do is walk through two double doors down to where the close to where the, the podium is and get my accordion and walk back out. And so I'm going down there and my accordion's over here on the on the right hand side of the platform there. And on the left hand side of the platform is the door that leads to the pastor's office. And I'm walking up to get my accordion and there's nobody I mean lights are out. I had to unlock the door. It, it's it's you know so I get and I, and I hear come from inside the pastor's office I hear <laughs> beating on the door. Beating on the wall. The door's open. I don't get scared. I just get irritated. I get mad. And so I'm like, I'm standing there with my cord in my hand. I'm like, okay, what else you got? Nothing, right? No silence. I said, whatever, dude. And so I turned and walked out. So, uh, you know, it's stuff like that happened to that place all the time. And, and people say, well, that's a sign that whatever, whatever. I don't know what it's a sign of. But I do know that foul spirits appear to be attracted to worship services. And that's something you got to be mindful of. So I, I promised you one more story. And uh, we that same place, uh, my family, uh, we were on the rotation to clean the church. And we go up to the place and we're walking up and there's this like this little, uh, so you had a set of doors and you had a little area, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, uh, you know, 10 by 10. And then you had another set of doors, right? To go in, like a four year, whatever they call it. So we're walking through, and as I'm walking through, right, we hear people talking in the auditorium. 
I can see through the glass doors that there's nobody there. But I thought, well, there's somebody standing off the side here. It was distinctly two men speaking. And we opened the glass doors to get in the building. And as soon as we opened the glass doors, the conversation stopped. There was nobody there. I said, what did you do? Well, my, I'm there with my kids and my wife's there. And we all heard it, right? We all heard it. And uh, uh, what, what are you going to do? You're going well, to pack up and leave? Well, the house is, the, the church is haunted. Let's go home. Well, we, we, we made arrangements to, to, uh, to clean the place. So we, I told my kids, I said, Suck it up. I said, Jesus is here with us. And we will clean this place. So we clean the place. The whole time we're cleaning the place, we're hearing doors open and close in the back end of the church building. And it's just like, and at one point we had seen a, uh, uh, you could see uh, underneath the door frame, you can see through the, inside the auditorium, you see out the glass doors, you can see the, the wooden doors. You could see, you know, when somebody would walk in front of the door, you could see a shadow underneath the door frame. But we saw, uh, I was walking towards it anyway, I had to go find one of my kids, and I'm walking out that way, and I see a shadow, so that's probably him right outside the door. And I go, and I go through the glass doors, and I open the wooden doors, and there's nobody there. I mean, nobody, and it wasn't like they were standing there and they had time to run, because it's just all open area right there. And uh, so, there there was nobody there. But I'd seen the shadow, but there was nobody there. Well, sitting out in the parking lot is a guy who's a, a part of the church, and he does the uh, landscaping and grass cutting and stuff. He's out there taking a nap in his truck, but there's no way he got from that door to his truck and then laid down and was. But I, I was telling him, I said, "Well, he says he says it's funny. He said just a just a few seconds before uh, you came out, he said somebody came over and tried the door handle on my truck, and I sat up and there's nobody there." Say, what are you telling all these stories for, Mike? Just to establish that the the you know there's many voices in the world and none of them is without signification. And um, foul spirits are attracted to places of worship, and so we shouldn't be surprised that this guy was at the church service where Jesus was at. And uh, it's interesting to note that uh, like in Mark five, which we'll get to. At this rate, we'll get to it somewhere before the next century. This devil, this foul spirit, knows exactly who Jesus Christ is. And uh, and he is is aware of who Jesus is, and he's aware of the sort of uh, uh, behavior that Jesus Christ is capable of. This devil is worried that Jesus Christ has come to destroy him. And what you don't see in the Bible, they they call him the Holy One of God. What you don't see in the Bible is you don't see devils disrespecting Jesus. You don't see him snarling at him. You don't see him, you know, shrieking and like vampires and you show him a crucifix or some nonsense. Uh, devils are oddly reverent. There's no back talk and there's no, there's no defiance. And Matthew 8 is the next stop, the last stop, because <clears throat> I ran out of gas somewhere in the middle of that ghost story. Matthew 8, you say, I don't believe that story you told. Well, okay, well, I, mean, I was there, so you weren't. So I, don't, I mean, I'm not saying you should base your life off anything like that, but there it is. Matthew 8. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, when Jesus came into Peter's house. Actually, you know something? We're going to stop there. We're going to stop on that note. Um, the guy was at the synagogue. Jesus cast out his devils. And then from there, Jesus leaves the synagogue and goes to Peter's house. And we'll cover that next time. Okay. I got to finish this up. Other things are going on right here. And uh, so thank you for listening. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner. Thank you for listening, all four of you, and I'll see you on the other side.